I'm Dr. Scott Lynn, Director of Research and Education for Swing Catalyst. And I have with me my good friend, Joe Plecker. Thank you. Director of Instruction at the Landings Club in Savannah, Georgia, top 100 teacher. Um, been using, he has one of the coolest facilities that I've seen. He's got a dual plate in one bay, a single plate in the other bay. He's decked out with <laughs> ground reaction force measurement <laughs> tools all over the place. And today we're going to be talking about torque. Yes. Yeah. So golf is inherently a rotational game and, and I've seen golfers get more horizontal force and, you know, club fate slow down, impact conditions get worse. I've seen vertical forces go up and club speed slow down and impact conditions get worse. Not sure if you've ever seen it with torque. Yeah. I feel like it is something that a lot of golfers struggle with creating and I don't think you can have too much of it. It's, it's an essential force and it's, uh, I call torque uh, a hub force. And as we like to show in our 3D, we can tell uh, horizontal torque and vertical forces in that order. And you have to follow that. And you might be a golfer that uses, uh, you have a little bit of linear and rotational turn and not much vertical. And you can be a really powerful ball striker. You could also be a, what we call might a, a side cover golfer who likes to turn and jump at the same time. Kind of a Justin Thomas look there too. And we really see that rotation is in everybody. We, we sometimes see a trifecta, a player that hits all three of those forces and maxes out in them. But no matter who you are, you've got to have a torque force in your golf swing. And with the use of the dual plates, the ability to look at the contributions of the left foot and the right foot in this important force, it's been transformational for me to be able to look at the moment when a player needs to have more torque, what foot should be working harder to apply that torque, and then give them specific drills to fix it. And it's really been an, an amazing quick fix. It, it's very fast once you see the numbers from where they are. So, you know, looking at torque, it's, it's probably for me, um, I'm looking at a dominant force when someone hits. Uh, sometimes we like to call it that player's superpower. You know, might get a golfer who uh, isn't hitting it great, but maybe their, their linear force uh, is, is off the chart. And I'm going, That's, we're not going to break that. We're going to keep that. But if they're underperforming in torque, we then go, well, what, what foot is that player going to feel the ground best with? And how are they going to use this? Um, could you bring up the Bryson DeChambeau swing for me? Uh, that one at the, um, that Colt says Colt beers on it. Yeah. So uh, in my facility at the landings, uh, Bryson DeChambeau uh, came out and he was practicing hitting golf balls before we had a building. And he was visiting a friend. It was the, the week before Thanksgiving at the match where he lost, uh, but he, he came out to practice and he did a great job. And he came back to visit his same friend and we had the building up and he came in and went, wow, this is really cool. This is what I have. And we started talking a lot about his swing and his forces. And, you know, you can kind of see up here in the middle, uh, this is a torque force for Bryson. Uh, Bryson's definitely what we consider to be a trifecta player. If you notice in all those forces, He's peeking out at his linears, his torque, and his verticals, and they're all happening in perfect harmony right there. But what was interesting was when Bryson was sharing with me what foot he felt he gets the most torque from. And if you watch closely on the video here as it plays, watch, watch his left foot as he swings, literally pulls back. And Bryson puts a lot of energy. He said, I feel like when I shift into my front leg, my energy is running down the leg like a slide, like I'm on a sliding board. And if right I get the end of that sliding board, I pull back. And so he's using a lot of left leg influence to generate the torque force numbers that we see. And I thought that was fascinating because I was looking at his right foot on the plate, but here's a player telling me it was his left. And so with that knowledge, um, just to share a quick use case too, can you bring up the uh, Tim O'Neill second to last? So I'm lucky, I'm, I'm in Savannah, Georgia, and they're great players, uh, like I'm sure everywhere in your facility too, but Tim O'Neill is a phenomenal um, player. He just qualified for full status on the Champions Tour. And I've been working with Tim for about a year now, and what we noticed in Tim was that he got the club a little too far into out. Um, he never liked the, the fact that when he played in a golf event, he'd hit the shot 20 feet right of the flag, and everybody would say, nice shot. And he knew it wasn't a good shot. 
he knew it could be closer. And that's because he used to get a little too much linear. And if you notice, Tim's first move on the backswing was he had a very distinct pelvic shift. His body moved to the trail side, and then he began turning away from the target and moving to the top of his backswing. But we have a really simple test, and that's the uh, with his arms out, um, something we like to do on the plates. And if you could draw a line on the outside of Tim's left hip for me, we're going to see something interesting about Tim. And uh, by the way, this is a pivot test um, that we do on the plates. Where a player stands, we have them face a wall. Their, their hands and arms are extended, palms to the ground. And I let them turn a few times, looking at the wall in front of them. But on the last one, we close their eyes. And they have to turn just how they stay balanced. And it's because they don't want to fall over. And what it does, it tells us very clearly uh, what a person's post is. And you can see Tim, as he pivots, his left hip actually breaks into that line. And it was apparent to me that Tim did everything well from what I call top down. I mean, his grip matchups, his path, perfect. But there was something missing in the swing. And if we could go to the last one for Tim. Even the, uh, before you leave there, oh, what's sorry. really interesting is he's moving his arms to the right. But you'll notice that his pressure is shifting to the left. Going to the left. So as he goes this way, he finds balance by leaning a little left. And especially with your eyes closed, it becomes a survival test. Because when your eyes are closed, you're just trying to not fall over. Right. And once you start moving your arms to the right, if your body leans this way, it's probably going towards its strength. And so that tells us he's a little more left leg dominant individual. And, and this was something that um, was amazing because here's a player at this extreme level who really never knew what his post was. And uh, what we did, well, this was about two weeks before he played at Pebble Beach in the first T event. Um, and Tim led by two shots on Saturday. And I thought, oh, boy, this is really going well. And then he faded a little bit on Sunday. And I called and said, hey, I was around. And he said, I hit it too good. I, I airmailed greens that were right over the flag. So it wasn't a negative. It was actually a positive that he said, I, I just hit the ball too well. And, and I think a lot of it had to do with understanding Tim's structure. Now, if you watch this on the backswing, Tim's left hip is going to stay in place. He's going to start his pivot. And for him, this created a, a very neutral swing path. Uh, Tim's direction of the club, slightly in doubt always, but he's never really going to have a block anymore in the shots. And it's given him that much better ball striking quality. And my, my point about working with the plates is that I would have never seen that. I, I just would have never had an opportunity to test and observe that where his body moved and his pressure to make that change uh, two weeks before a tour event. And so the great news is that Tim's ready for a big season. He starts mid-February, uh, and, and we're really excited about what he's going to do. Yeah, those are some really interesting changes. Can you go back to the first swing like before you did all this? Notice here how he takes the club into his right side. Can you take that back a little bit? Actually, blow the pressure up for me if you could. Just go to detailed data or something. Yeah, there you go. So you see how the pressure goes into his right side and it kind of stalls out there for a second. It goes into his toe and keep going. Then it kind of drops into his heel. Keep going. And then it turns around and goes left. So there's a stall out in his pressure here. And I think that could be he's getting on his weaker leg and can't really get off it. And he kind of gets stuck here. And as he goes over and go to the new one now. We didn't even talk about that at no. all, right? No. And now look at it goes right, turns around and goes left. So you've created a more efficient pattern for him there. Um, it, and I think you've taken him away from kind of his weakest or less dominant leg and let him use his strength a lot better. It's, it's something that I like to call collateral improvement, that it's, it's something in the swing that we didn't address, but it got better when we fixed this amazing hub force of what is happening with his pivot. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I want to show one more uh, use case, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example of a real-world golfer. Now, I know when you come to these events, I've been coming to the show a long time, and we like to throw up, you know, here's our, our best, best example. I'm going to show you a real-world example of me using this plate and getting some major improvement here. If you could bring up the Mark Benko, the first swing. Yeah. You can play that one. Yeah. Yep. 
So, uh, and this could be the uh, yeah. uh, full view with the forces? Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the red arrow is his right foot, the blue arrow is his left foot, and the green arrow is the combined of the two. Okay, so that's just a it's a, it's a, yeah, it's the combined two. So if you add both of them together, you get this one. Um, I think you, you have to calibrate where the plates are, and I think the, the, the camera moved a little bit, so that's why they're a little off. But yeah, so he can fix that really quickly. So, so this, is a golf, this is a golfer that uh, gave me permission to do this, and he said, there's no way I'm coming. I don't want to be there. I don't want a room full of golf professionals looking at my swing. But he gave me permission. This is cool. And um, this gentleman here um, uh, is a snowbird. And he came down to the club and he goes, hey, I got four months and I want to get better at golf. Now, when you watch the forces over here and you see, well, you see something at the top, right, that we see a lot, the over swinging of the golf club, right? The long distance of the club back. Um, and you look at what's happening in the forces. Now, the forces that we see, those mountains that I call, those pyramids as they go up, that's when we're going into positive resistance. That's when we're moving towards the target. But we see something important when it's negative or maybe it's just very flat. The player is really not resisting. They're just working away from the target. Now, I asked uh, Mark, and you can kind of keep playing that too. I asked Mark a very important question. I said, what are you trying to do? <laughs> and he told me I was told to turn away from the target, to turn all the way to the top. And what that caused for him is a lot of collapse in the arms, no resistance in the body and very little force in the golf swing. So we came up with a drill and um, uh, this is a drill that I use. Can you show this one from down line? And so I'm standing outside the bay. Uh, I've got a four pound uh, medicine ball and I started out close and I tossed it to him in his golf posture and he had to catch it and resist it. And as I stepped back a little farther, and started arcing the ball a bit more. It got heavier to catch. And you'll see now um, he's turning away, but look at how quickly when he catches it that he's, he's turning away to catch the golf ball, but look at how quickly he resists. So now he's learning in his backswing to positively turn his torque force towards the target, to start shifting towards the target while his arms are going back. And I'd say that's an elite move that might have taken us a long time to get that thought process over. But I could share this and immediately show it. And could you go to his, his other swing? And granted, um, this was all part of a process, but a big part of our training. We'd start every practice session with about 10 minutes of this ball drill. And what we found was that Mark was able to go into this positive resistance a little sooner. And you'll see his golf club in a much different position at the top. And we can see some club data too. He's hitting a seven iron now, 160 yards, which is tremendous going from about 130. Uh, and this was really just about a concept. And I, I, I have a theory that golfers are pretty intelligent. They're pretty smart people. But a lot of times the, the way that the concepts describe can be very confusing. I didn't show Mark a graph. I didn't show him a graph I didn't point him at, at peak and negative forces. I knew what I had to tell him and how to swing it. But isn't it something, I mean, for all of us, when you know, you've heard a player come to you and they've simply overdone a thought. You know, maybe Mark was doing this in his swing and somebody said, you've got to turn in your back swing. Well, he had completely overdone that, but didn't know how to stop the club. So that's just an example. Sometimes we talk about the positive ones. Sometimes I like to see you know, when is that player going into positive resistance? And this is an amazing tool that shows this to me. Yeah, we talked about this last night with the long drivers. I think what creates speed in a golf swing is not producing forces, it's decelerating them and stopping Slowing. them. Yeah, and I think what Joe does really well is he takes a complex movement like a golf swing, because I think a lot of times when you put a golf club in people's hands, they now have to be a golfer. And they kind of lock themselves up and you make them an athlete first. First so got to feel it, yeah. Throwing that ball at him and saying, all you got to do is catch this and throw it back to me. He's not going to go like this because yeah. no one would do that, right? Nobody would do and that. And so getting him athletic at catching and throwing it back allowed him to activate muscles where he wasn't even thinking about it. And I think yeah. that's what he's excellent at is finding one cue that accomplishes 20 things. Way better way to coach than finding 20 cues to accomplish 20 things.
So there's absolutely no way that they're going to be able to do that. And that, that associative part of, of the creative part and, and everyone that uses this device really has a different way of connecting with their players and sharing with them what to do. Um, I wanted to show a couple drills that I use for Torx and um, with an example first. And I'm gonna, you're going to be my, my pivot Perfect. guy first. Sounds good. So let's do the pivot test first and, and stand up on the mat. Yep. We'll go live here. Arms extended, palms to the ground, and let's make our pivot back. Am I going to do it with eyes closed? You, you can, yeah, go ahead. So Scott is going to go, uh, you're going to notice his pressure goes more to his trail leg. And he's what we call a right post golfer. And we see this back here. Notice in our trace when we pivot back, go, we'll take it away. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you. You'll notice um, our maximum pressure clearly goes to the right. And you can see a pelvic shift over to the right. Now, when I do this test for a lot of players and they see it, they always ask the same thing. They go, is that good? And I go, it's just you. It's okay. It can be anything. Now, um, when I do the test, I'm going to share the test here real quick. Sure. And I'll go arms, eyes closed. And I'm going to be much more of a front post golfer. And uh, that's just how my center of mass works around. Doesn't nearly get as far to the right. And what you're going to see from here is my pelvis almost goes a little forward. I've got two different drills that um, I'm going to teach Scott a drill for torque on his downswing. And when you notice the forces, could we go back to uh, maybe a Bryson there, the uh, one under Colt? It says Colt, actually. Colt beers. Thank you. Um, what I've found with the, the forces, I call them a pulse. And if you've ever had an EKG and you've looked at the heartbeat, bump, 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 up, down, they want to be sharp. And you want to get these pulses in the swing. And notice, notice Bryson's linear force, up, down, vertical forces, up, down. And then those verticals are just a really sharp peak and drop. And that's a pulse. So I, I got a, a great friend of mine at the Performance Center, Eric Coots, uh, helped me design. It's just an alignment stick that we cut down to an iron length. We put some uh, corks in here and made a grip over top of it. And I call it a whip stick. And it's you got a real grip and, and you can really whip this thing. You can hear it. And the idea, like we talked about peak decelerations to match up with where we're putting some force in the ground makes a great feel. Now, I have... Um, in the torque, in the torque forces to make a turn in your pelvis, your trail foot actually pulls back. And so this backwards motion causes your pelvis to turn forward. And with this slider here on top of the front of the right foot here, I'm going to demonstrate this first. Sure, you do it. go for it. And I think I've got enough room. When I take it back to my top position, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to pull down and back. Now, that dual, that combination of me pulling against the ground and lowering and literally decelerating this. I'm going to try to break it here. And I've never been able to break it because it's short. But you're trying very hard to pull down and stop. And the idea here, go ahead and try it, Scott. Sure. The idea here is for a right post golfer, for a golfer that did that pivot test, that's awesome Oof. right there. That's good super cool yeah yeah so that pivot test what what i like about that for scott is that he feels it out of his right foot now if, if i did that with bryson dechambeau if he came in the studio he'd say i hate this mm -hmm. i don't like that drill at all because he feels more front post more left post action now uh with the resistance band go ahead and grab that for me so now um you go okay well what if you're that player that tested to be more in your front foot like me well a great test and scott really showed me how to do this well we put it around the player's trail hip and i'm going to get set here in my golf stance may i use right on the plate there sure and when i pivot back scott's going to try to pull me over and i have to push out of the front of my left foot i have to push from my toe to my heel and this is helping me rotate and pull back. And this is a great feel, the associative for what I do using my left leg to generate some torque. So as I'm feeling that, I'm creating that associative move that creates more turn in the golf swing. And 
before I go into some questions or go too far down my own uh, thought here, without, without the help of swing catalysts, the dual plates, the force plates, I thought that torque came from how your pelvis moved. And uh, very humbly sharing this with you, I was a, I, I used 2D, I videotaped a lot of golf swings and I put a line on somebody's backside and I watched them come down and I'd say, oh, you came off of that wall. Turn your hips, keep your body on the wall. And I never talked about the feet or the forces. And then I put my swing on it and my hips came off the wall <laughs> because I'm a front post guy who's gonna use a little more jump in my swing. And I can't say enough as, as a golf coach, as a, a, just a, a lifelong fan of the game, what the technology, the, the research that Dr. Scott Lynn and this network of, of dedicated ambassadors and instructors do, it's unbelievable. And, and you made a big difference. And I, I like to say that Scott Lynn is probably one of the coolest guys in golf who knows the most because he gets to go all over the world and hang out with people using this device and take their best tips and go, I'm going to steal that one. So, but I, I stole a couple from him too. So, but, um, with that, those are just a couple examples of a torque force, how to measure what the person's pivot is, match up what leg you're trying to light up. And if you don't know, try both. It's okay to try both a little bit and see if somebody can do the pulse drill with the right foot or the band drill with the left and put them back out and let them hit balls. Yeah, that's great. I, I think what you're doing there is allowing them to explore the edges um, because generally the answers are going to be somewhere in between. But if I do a little better with the left foot drill, then I'm going to err more on that side. If I do a little more with the right foot drill and, uh, and this drill that we did with the arms out turning, I call it kind of a dumb man's Mike Adams post, right? So it takes away your opinion. You don't have to watch and say, I kind of think it's this. I kind of think it's that. It just kind of shows you on the screen. So it takes away a lot of the ambiguity around it. But it's all based on that posting style and, um, methodology that Mike invented, you know, a long time ago. It, and it's really important with that test that we can we can know precisely what you're doing more than another. Mm -hmm. And so what it might, you might look at um, a player like Tim who broke through and used more of his left, but he's really more center, but just a slight bit of left. Right. And I think that's what helped me give him the best advice to go play with. Yep. And ultimately that's what we want as coaches is the, the best advice to give to our players. Yeah, and I like seeing golf swings as continuums rather than boxes, right? So Michael talk about sometimes rear post, center post, front post. I see it more as a continuum. Yeah. So you put Tim just slightly front of center. Just a little you bit. You would put me eh, probably <laughs> way over towards yeah. the rear. I'm a pretty rear dominant golfer. And so figuring that out using the force plate becomes a lot easier rather than trying to estimate it from your eyes. And I think that's what the force plate is really important for. It, it shows you things your eyes can't see. So it digs under the hood and, and sees the engine in each of our golfers. And I think what it's really helped me do a lot is not to rob our golfers of their, their, their gift. natural gift. Yeah. yeah. So uh, working with Colin Morikawa recently, you know, you see him with the shut face, very rotational. I thought he'd have a lot of torque. We got him on the plate. He had massive verticals. Um, and that is Colin Morikawa. That's what makes him who he is. And so any drill we did that brought vertical down, I was like, hey, we're not doing that. Yeah. And it allows you not to go down those rabbit holes that are robbing your player of their gift too long and making that stick and letting them get frustrated. As soon as I saw that, I was like, hey, no, ax that. We're not doing that anymore. And so really understanding what to leave into a golf swing and what not to touch is something you, I think you can make much more educated decisions with the force plate. So I'd like to... Um take some questions and at the same time too just want to share one quick thought do you ever think why hogan used that extra spike to create some more ground force right to create some more torque you know we look at a lot of players and and i i we can see it you know we can watch a, a good player you know greg norman's famous foot slide going back scotty you know, scheffler, Scottie now scheffler. Too, yeah. yeah and we see uh my my bubba watson you know kind of finish this way too and you go yeah that's what's happening here mm. and so it's been phenomenal then when we had that and i love what you said it's it's a gift it's a each player usually has a superpower they have a gift and um and when i go around ranges and see a helpful parent or relative going you know keep your head down don't don't keep your feet on the ground you know don't move and you go oh boy okay we might be robbing that player of their gift so 
Any any questions? Anything I can help with? On that test, would you look at two things? You look at the pelvis and the pressure. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So what we'll do on the test here, and and maybe just hold it. Hold do it. You want, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you want Ron to do it? Come on up. Yeah. yeah. Come on up. You asked the question. We already yeah. know a lot about Ron. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. So so turn maybe turn on the plate for me too, so yeah. we'll capture this. So we we'll use the advantage while we're at here, and and just practice a few times. Just eyes straight out in front of you. Just eyes open. Just practice turning. See, we already got we got a golf pro here. We got to tell him what to do. Yeah, don't don't turn your head. Okay, so you got to keep your head forward. So that's it. Yeah. And so when you're doing this, you know, you see a player influence the test. Right, they went this way. Did okay. you measure so one? So that's it's. You got to keep the head. Can you load it up, or did you this. not measure it? Okay, do it again. So let's see the one keep more your head time. Forward. Head forward, and we're just going to stay there as you pivot back. Yeah. Excellent. I and can tell already. <laughs> huge front post. Yeah. So. We know that about him. We've worked with him before. So he here's, a, here's a few traits that we see. The pelvis. Um, here's some other dead giveaways, too, is the lead knee action. So if I have a front post golfer, their lead knee tends to bend straight out over their front foot. If Can I have a center post the player, bigger? they're going to move a little diagonal. Their knee likes to work at maybe a 45-degree angle. Data centric, so pressure and if you're Scott Lynn, that knee might work right across. It might go almost touch knees when they go back. So you can tell that by their knee action as well. So you can see he gets 65% into his front Huge side. front post, right? So as his arms are moving this way, his lower body's moving this way, so he balances better around his front side. And so teaching him the same way you teach me. Disaster. We're going to hurt one of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so range of motion. So we'll look at, and uh, I think Ben Shear did a great job of, you know, calling players, are you a resistor or are you a releaser? And if you have a range of motion or some flexibility, you're going to be a resistor. We're going to see that lower body resist against the turning of the torso and mid thoracic. But when we look at a releaser, uh, usually that's a golfer with a limited range of motion. And that could be anybody, not just a senior player, but we would take that golfer and narrow their stance we would close their stance, we would flare their trail foot, we would add some knee bend, and then when they pivot, they actually have very little differential between the top and bottom, but we've created a much fuller range of motion. So the other great part is that we can tell from stance widths, foot flares, centers, alignments, how this makes a huge difference in creating the range of motion we want in the player. When I first started coaching, and, and I, I, for any teachers out there, you know this feeling, right? You're going out to give your first clinic and everybody put a shaft down and I want to see railroad tracks, feet, knees, hips, and shoulders lined up and balls go everywhere. And you go, well, that didn't work. <laughs> I got everybody lined up straight and that didn't help. So what I've found with this is that the, the alignment has to match the qualities of the swing we're trying to create. And by the way, if I did that for the player to create that, that golfer is going to have a lot more su substantial vertical move when they hit it. So I have to be sure that that's a good fit for them as well. And we might find that maybe that range of motion, if they're a little bit under, didn't do a great job for what we're trying to fit with them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's not always that black and white answer, but it's going to help you make a decision on whether it's good for your player or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think, too, and this is, goes back to that ball test, right? If you're going to toss the ball, it's not really the, the how much differential that I see. It's the, it's the player's ability to begin resisting in the backswing to create a counter movement to their upper body. And it doesn't have to be far. It, it, it doesn't need to be. I mean, it could be a female size resistance, creating resistance right away in the backswing. So when we lose that aesthetic model that, okay, I've got to get hips to 45, shoulders to 90, club parallel, toe down, well, we might have made that player worse. And Tony Finau can do it, but he's also better when he creates a lot of resistance. His body's countering early in the backswing to do that. So that's just another example of how I can measure yeah. it. And I think he talked about some things to look at to guess whether, if you don't have this technology, whether your player is rear or front, and if this knee collapses toward this, obviously it shifts my pressure into my right side. That player has to keep flex in that right knee to get off of it now, right? So they got to push this way. A lead leg dominant player can actually straighten that leg 
because they don't need it, right? We're kind of getting off of it and that tips the left side of the pelvis lower and, and sets them up to use their stronger leg. So this is a good match. This is a weird match, right? Yeah. And me going over here and straightening my leg is a terrible match. So this knee collapsing in and keeping some flex here and this knee going towards the golf ball and this knee straightening are both good matches. So aligning them to use their strengths, I think is good. So allowing that left or right leg to straighten in a front post player is great. If you told me to keep my right leg straight, you'd rob me of my my dominant power source. Any other questions too? I, I, I know um, it's amazing he can hit a ball after all the tips he's got. So. <laughs> Yeah, if, if they're vertical, right? Remember, uh, so in order to jump, my pelvis has to adduct. It's got to come under so that I can uh, align my centers of mass to do that. So we see that's an okay thing, right? And uh, Brian Gay, you know, look up Brian Gay's golf swing on YouTube, and you'll see him every time, you know, come e extend up. You know, he's going to use a lot of verticals. And at impact, Brian Gay's hips, chest, and club all face the ball at the same time. Pretty good. You know, and that's that's the thing. You know, we we. I, w I just want to say, as an instructor, you know, we we used to put a lot of that back on the player, like, hey, you're bot, you don't do this and that, right? And, but now, like we said, that superpower, like, let me see what you got. Um, Vinny Dyroff, who's a coach at at the landings with me, we sometimes get players and go, oh my gosh, look at, look at this chart, and we don't even care what the swing looks like. We're like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Let's do more of that. And stuff, good stuff starts to happen. So the aesthetic of the swing has, to me, become very second. It's, it's just so far down the line. Like in, in my studio, I don't have any swing sequences. I don't have any hero shots. I don't have any like, like you got to look like that. You know, it's more of like, let me just see you up, up here. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, like uh, beyond beyond allowing players to extend, what are things that I've that have kind of gone against conventional wisdom? Um, I think creating the torque on the plate and and really understanding it's a shearing force on your feet. In other words, your ability to pull back and push forward is what's creating the torque. And I I said this earlier to Scott that you know I think a lot of times I'd look at a player and try to get them to create a force in their pelvis to create the turn when I wasn't addressing the ground force, and when I've started to look at that, it's made it's made all of that go away. So it it to me when I see someone who's underperforming in a torque value, I'm going to look at their feet, and and a lot of times I like to look at what's what's under their shoe. Um, I like to see a lot of what part of their foot is engaging the ground. I see a lot of bad uh, turners in the golf swing who tend to work heel to toe. They have a, they have a, a pattern in their swing where they, they work back here and they work here. And, and you go, oh, you're over the top. Well, as soon as we get them to engage the top of their foot and pull back, they look at their swing and go, I, I've never looked like that before. And all we did was address the pressure and the timing of the force. So the pulse drill, uh, those things have been like, wow, so simple to see how that's changed. And to me, the, the torques have been amazing. More on the fitness side, so the one that I thought was really interesting too is like if you do like med ball slams, right? Like you all think it's here now. Yeah. But isn't it really, it's this. Well, and, and. Right? Like doing, doing exercises or even like a throw, like if I'm going to do a med ball throw, this is not the right pressure pattern. Well, we'll talk a little on verticals real quick too. So, so for vertical forces, um, can you bring up Kate Barber, the one they have there with uh, Kate? Um, and so, Kate Kate Barber is um, uh, an amazing junior golfer that I coach in Savannah. Kate's, uh, can you bring up the single? So, Kate's verticals, uh, she hits uh, 176 percent of her body mass, and Kate puts a lot of vertical force on the ground as that front post player, and she creates a, a very well-timed release. So verticals do two things. They, they shallow the golf club, and they open the golf club. 
And so for Kate, she had a grip when we started that was like almost her palm at the target, you know, so far over and way under this way because she was trying to stay down and, and she couldn't help but hit blocks and hooks. So we changed that. We could move her grip structure around and the timing of the verticals for Kate, she describes it as feeling like when she gets to the top, at the top of the elevator, she likes to free fall down. And then as she gets to the bottom, it's just an entire extension move. And we talk about her making her left side as tall as it can be. Uh, and and if, I, if we measured anything on Kate, it's from her tiptoe on her left foot to the tip of her left shoulder and just get her as high as she can. And when she's timed it well, um, the, like the slam, one thing I like to use is I take um, a, a ball like in, that you can hold in your hand, like a softball size and let the player swing and they've got to actually throw it down a little bit in front of where the golf ball is. And the reason why is that this is for a cover golfer where their trail arm extends, not back here, not here, but here. And so we put kind of a tee in the ground and extend the club there or extend your arm there. And that gives a great associative of what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I think designing your med ball throw or designing your drill based on the person is really important. Not everybody you based on what, force is most important to them in their golf swing you can design the drill or the release pattern or you know whether we do the, the slider under my right foot decel here or we do the left leg torque drill so picking the appropriate drill for the appropriate person is is super important i think with the yeah. force plate you can make much more educated and, decisions and it's a great about thing that. it's a great thing to do too i think you know the simplest thing is you know, put a player's hands on a table and tell them to push the table into the ground and they they feel right away what that does and, and I've always said a, a force has to create the counter force. In other words, I can't just jump and not push down on it. So I really feel like that movement in the trail arm is so critical to create the force that creates the counter force. And what we find is that maybe the harder I can get a player to move, the harder I can get them to load, the more I can generate the force. So it all has a lot to do with then th the finding that player's trigger. What's the thing that makes them want to go faster and we we get players all the time you know scott and i talk a lot you know training above your limit you know training way above your limit to give us some room then when you go play and you swing to raise your new normal right yeah and i think that's what the speed training stuff has taught us right if you're if you can get in on the plate here in the indoor conditions where you don't have to go find it and you can raise your speed up to you know say your cruising speed is 98 miles an hour if you get to 110 in the and you don't really care where it's going, then hopefully your, your gamer can get to 105 or whatever. Totally. So raising that ceiling, I think, is super important. We know how important speed is to strokes gained now and, and to, to play in better golf. I, I just want to say um, one thing and uh, to all my friends here, everybody, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm, I'm available. I'm at the Landings Club in Savannah, Georgia. Um, I'm really easy to find in the PGA directory, too. Uh, we do a lot of education and events with this. Uh, to talk for a minute about swing catalyst i can't say enough about tom and his team uh the support that they've given me and i and i don't mean support to do events like this but whenever we've had an issue or something that we need help with their team stays up they fix it overnight i come back and everything's working beautifully i've only had that happen once uh the device is rock solid but Scott Lynn and the whole team of education what he does uh to make us all better is just incredible and if you're thinking about a pressure, a force, or a motion plate, you just there's there's nobody even in the same room with these guys. So um, just want to thank them for all the support they've given me and helped me make a better coach. Perfect. Thank you, thank you Joe. That was incredible. Thanks, sir. Thank you, buddy.